got this court order. This matter should be determined in the courts and should be determined out here. If he still doesn't move, then we'll try to get by him. Pushing? We're pushing a little bit. It's so fantastic in this day and time to even uh, be ha trying to handle a governor of a sovereign state just like a common lawbreaker. Tonight on The American Experience, Kennedy versus Wallace, a crisis up close. Good evening, I'm David McCullough. You're about to see a film like no other ever made. In 1963, Robert Drew was granted permission to film the President of the United States making decisions during a moment of national crisis. Such access had never before been granted to a filmmaker, nor has it ever again. John Kennedy thought it would serve the interests of history. Nothing was rehearsed, no lights were set up in the Oval Office. The result was shown just once on television in that same year. But then some of the dialogue in the Oval Office was covered over with narration, as it is not here. What was happening, what was said, are what you will see and hear. In addition to the retrospective observations of two key figures in the story, Vivian Malone and Nicholas Katzenbach. The time is June 1963. The governor of Alabama, George C. Wallace, has decided to stand in the schoolhouse door, as promised in campaign speeches, in order to keep black students from enrolling at the University of Alabama. How will, how should, the president respond? Until now, the administration has been equivocating on civil rights, fearful of alienating powerful Southern segregationists in Congress who might block Kennedy programs in many areas. It was a momentous year, Martin Luther King's March on Washington would come later that summer. It was also John Kennedy's last year. He was killed six months later. June 1963. The presidency of John F. Kennedy is facing a crisis over civil rights and a showdown in Alabama with Governor George Wallace. Attorney John P. Cole, Montgomery Attorney, close friend of the governor, is in the advance. Robert Kennedy is Attorney General of the United States. Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach is about to leave for Alabama to confront a challenge facing the Kennedy administration there. Burke Marshall is head of the Civil Rights Division. Well, I'm about to go over to the uh, White House with the Attorney General to discuss all this with the President. On desegregation, the courts have been leading and the Congress has been lagging. The presidency has been cautious, trying to avoid violence in the South and a backlash against its efforts to get new civil rights legislation through the Congress. But Robert Kennedy is on his way to the White House to discuss events in Alabama that could drive the presidency to take the lead. The governor of Alabama, George Wallace, is threatening to defy the order of a federal court calling for the integration of the University of Alabama, the last major university still holding out against desegregation. Wallace has become the spearhead of Southern states' rights sentiment against the federal government, and he has made a campaign promise to block integration. Such defiance would challenge the power of the attorney general and the president. But Wallace has sworn to stand in the schoolhouse door to prevent the admittance of two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood. They have already been accepted by the university, and they are committed to enroll in spite of the governor's opposition. More than 25 years have passed since that time, and much has changed. Vivian Malone is a wife, a mother, an executive with the Environmental Protection Agency looking back at herself as a student during that event in the history of desegregation. At that time, Alabama was the last major school to have been uh, desegregated. And I recognized that I had, and I was playing a role in that. Before I went there, it was closed to blacks. And that view, that position was sanctioned and promoted by the governor. Um, 
which is completely different from today. Once the governor, you know, took his stand, I recognized that I needed help. Assigned to help Vivian Malone and James Hood enroll at the university was a task force headed by Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach, the other participant also looking back at that moment in history. But a number of things in this country came together in the early 60s. One was Dr. King leading blacks in the South. There was a young president in the White House uh, and his brother as a as Attorney General, uh, who truly believed in equality. What happened in June 1963 was recorded. The President agreed to admit cameras into the Oval Office and a film was made, the first ever to show a President making decisions during a crisis. The film was broadcast once, 25 years ago. Since then, only excerpts of it have been seen. What follows is the film as it was originally made, shortened only to include recollections and thoughts today of two of its principals then, Nicholas Katzenbach and Vivian Malone. Not in the 100 years since Abraham Lincoln had the power of the American presidency been completely committed to the equality of the Negro race in the United States. Nor had it been on this day, June 10, 1963. In the next 30 hours, John F. Kennedy will have to make a chain of decisions deeply affecting millions of Americans and the future of his own presidency. Finally, a more far-reaching decision of historic consequence for the president is whether or not to commit the presidency in a speech before the United States and the world behind racial equality as a moral issue. McLean, Virginia, home of Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. George Wallace. statement he made the other day that to live is not all of life and to die is not all of death. I'd rather live a short life of standing for principle and live a long life of compromise. Of course, that may not mean much to you folks, but 
When you think of the uh, people who were involved in the Freedom Rides, and it was done for a cause, and uh, my agenda was there too. But it was one of those things that we had to do. Yeah. I think it does us good to, to reflect and draw on the courage of people who do fight and stand for what they believe in. And there were brave folks on both sides of that combat. There was just a lot more of them than there were of us. All today. Those are convicts. I'm getting too old to do this. I don't know. I don't think y'all. Hey, Joe. How y'all? Hey, this moral issue. A moral issue it comes from your heart in the first place. If I thought it was sinful and irreligious and immoral to separate myself socially and educationally from Negro citizens, then I would commit a sin when I did so, I suppose. But I, when, when, I believe that separation is good for the Negro citizen and the white citizen. In their best interest. And in their best interest. And uh, if I do something that my heart tells me is good for both groups, there's not anything that runs counter to any religion or any law of morality. Uh, 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 it's not sinful. When he talks about a moral issue, it's very, very difficult to understand the morality of a situation that would deny a person, you know, those rights. It's just a thing that the governor would say that uh, it wasn't about, um, you know, black versus white. It was about states' rights. You know, and I would hear that quite a bit, and I would say, that's not true. It was about black and white. He said he always wanted the best for whites and blacks in the state, but it certainly wasn't that he wanted the best for me. The Attorney General is head of the Department of Justice. He is responsible for enforcing the federal court order for the entrance of the two students in the University of Alabama. He is also responsible for working out a strategy for Alabama and for advising the president who must make the final decisions. Yes, sir. Susan, the meeting at the White House is not till 5.30. So 5.30? So, yeah. So uh, I wonder if we should move. Oh, General? Burke Marshall, the uh, Attorney General wanted to talk to you. Hey, uh, General? Uh, uh, I thought we should try to develop a plan about uh, what you, what's going to happen when General Graham gets there. Uh, now, I, I'm not very much in favor of picking the governor up and moving him out of the way. I think be much better if we could develop some system you had enough people just to push them aside or something. I don't want to take the governor up very much. These are familiar surroundings. Check the old old tomb. No, it's no, a beautiful, no, beautiful university. It's peaceful and serene, and it's going to be peaceful and serene on Tuesday. And, and Tuesday and every other day. After a Tuesday, I just want to. I just want you all to be sure that we have not one rock is thrown, or one big bat, nor one overt act of violence in any manner, Tuesday or any day thereafter. We're not going to let anybody desecrate this university. Because you've got agitators and provocateurs who come from other outside this state who themselves will want to stir up some violence uh, in order to uh, uh, hurt our cause. And to further their cause. To fur and to further their cause, because they thrive and raise money on disorder. And so, you people who are working under me, I just want you to know that that's my orders. We're going to keep the peace. 
all of our history. We'd been sweeping under the rug the real issues of racial equality. And many blacks were unhappy that nothing was really happening. I, I've heard the Kennedy administration was slow to do something on civil rights, and, uh, and maybe that's right. Uh, I certainly th think if I had been a black at that time, I would have felt they were slow. It's just hard looking back on it to realize that most congressmen didn't need black votes to be elected. It wasn't a lack of principle on President Kennedy's part. It was the fact that there wasn't any political support for it. Across the United States, pressures are rising for the president to speak out for racial equality as a moral issue. But a strong speech could cost the president Southern support for new civil rights legislation he would like to have. The president must decide whether or not to speak out anyway in a nationwide TV address. Next uh, question, which we we'll take up now, Mr. President, is whether you're going to make a nationwide TV address in connection with sending up the message. I didn't think so. It just really depends on whether we have something trouble on the university, then I would, but otherwise I didn't think that uh, we would at this point. I think it'd be helpful. I think it's a reason to do it. I think you could talk about the legislation and talk about employment and talk about education. To do it for 15 minutes, I think, would alleviate a lot of problems. Well, if we could do it, I suppose we could do it. I don't think we want to do it a half hour. I think it would take away a lot of the problems that we're having at the present time. It's going to be helpful to legislate. Well, you mean in the legislature? There are we, uh, is it going to be helpful to bring about an act on this legislature? Yeah. Because I think he's going to come across reasonable and understanding. And he's going to make a speech and nothing's going to happen, I presume. No, but he's going to introduce the legislation. Well, I think he can say that. We can, they're going to have some difficulties. And, and then describe the fact that we're going to have problems during this, uh, this summer. We hope that uh, the fact that we're making this kind of effort at the federal level that uh, Negroes would understand their responsibilities and... Uh, yeah, I don't... Uh, Legislative is going to hurt much more. Why? I think you get to the real of this thing on the hill, and that's when you may want to do this. Well, then you're going to have... That's not going to be September, October, November. I don't think you can get by now without saying, having an address on television. Larry O'Brien is expressing some concern as to whether or not the president making a speech would be helpful. You had all of the states in the South, uh, in effect, uh, enforcing segregation in a system less than, but not unlike South Africa, the apartheid system. And uh, the president knew that he would have a long, long, hard fight through the Congress to enact any civil rights legislation. I guess we're going to get something ready anyway because it may be that tomorrow. Well, we got a draft, which yeah. is not, doesn't fit all these points, but there's something to work with. And there's some pretty good sentences and paragraphs. All right. We're going to be here and it will help us get ready anyway because we may want to do it tomorrow. Okay. The president is still undecided, but the speech will be prepared. The president is relying on Robert Kennedy to plan a strategy for gaining the admission of the two students. Alabama is the last state still holding out against integration in its university system, and feelings on both sides are running high. If the president has to order in troops, a carefully timed strategy might avoid the riots that marked the integration of the University of Mississippi at Oxford. And look. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Was this General Abrams? Oh, all right. Hello? Hi, General. Army General Abrams is in Alabama to help plan any federal troop moves. Remember at the okay. Oxford, uh, when the troops came in uh, to start throwing things at them, even though they were the their own uh, National Guard, and uh, I just don't want to have, uh, we nationalize this, and, uh, and that uh, rouses everybody, and then they start turning on the soldiers, and, and then having a big battle out, and even before we get on the campus, that's what, I, with, a, with just a hundred men, it might, I just, I just want to make sure nothing happens. Well, we have the same problem uh, uh, 
at the University of Mississippi in the fall of 62. There were a lot of uh, people from outside, and, uh, not just university students by any means, a lot of people from outside who had guns, and there was uh, a riot started, and there was a great deal of shooting, and we ended up having to bring in uh, federal troops to, uh, to quell the riot, and uh, a number of people were wounded, and uh, at least one person was killed. That was a failure on the part of the federal government. Uh, we were determined not to let that happen again. In Birmingham, another Robert Kennedy deputy, John Doerr, briefs Vivian Malone and Jimmy Hood on the government's plan to enroll them at the university. We will enter the campus on University Avenue right here where the X is, drive down to this corner, drive up 6th Street, come out in front of Foster uh, Auditorium and park here and go up these steps. And whatever uh, meeting that's held with the governor will be held on the, in this particular area. And uh, you should dress as if you were going to church, for example, modestly, neatly, uh, uh, or like you're going to school the first day, just, uh, uh, and, uh, and you should uh, uh, remember that uh, it's a very dignified, orderly procedure. And, uh, it is kind of strange looking at yourself being really young. It's hard to believe that I was ever that young. I mean, there's, there's an innocence there that I can sense that um, probably was the reason why I was able to get through that. I think Hood and I both convinced ourselves that we were not afraid. You can get so frozen with fear about what's going to happen that there's no way you would go through it. We had to keep that up because otherwise, if we had ever allowed ourselves to just get frozen, mm -hmm. we couldn't have pursued it. Vivian is the daughter of a retired maintenance man, one of eight children in the family. Twenty years old, she has spent the last two at an all-Negro college. Vivian's admittance has already been approved by the University of Alabama where student and business groups have been trying to prepare for peaceful integration. Now, brought into the public eye by the governor's stand, Vivian goes to offices of the NAACP to rehearse answers she may have to give to public questions about the Negro drive for equality. The Negro has come a long way, but he still has a long way to go. Um, and that's quite, I think that's quite evident because of all the movements and protests and demonstrations that are going on throughout the country now. You know, every time you read them, you know that they're trying, they're, they're not um, willing to sit and wait, you know, say, well, it's coming eventually. Right. With advisor Jack Greenberg, Vivian discusses the governor's chances of preventing her admission to the university. You said there's a possibility that we might not be enrolled tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I think there's a good possibility. I think if the governor starts some confusion, we'll be brought back. And then they'll clean that place out, and then next time you go up, that'll be the end of it, you know. Okay. So that's it, right? And so if, if you come back, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. And if you don't, well, see you uh, we'll see you at the end of the semester. Study hard, and if you don't flunk out, we'll see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Vivian is already a cover subject for Newsweek magazine. Now, she's being photographed for time. You see that smile? I'm see the governor again. Nice smile. <laughs> I never really thought of myself as a beauty queen. I quickly put myself in the role of a scholar as opposed to any other roles that one might think of themselves in. But I thought of myself that that was my role in life. Uh, and at that point in time, my other role in life was to uh, become a certified public accountant. And, you know, after quickly researching the institutions in Alabama, and there were no black schools that offered accounting. Why do you want to go to the University of Alabama specifically and not some other university? The school that I was previously attending uh, became unaccredited in December of 1961. And the University of Alabama is accredited. Also being a resident of the state, I feel that I'm entitled to an education in the state. 
I've seen it happen myself. Here in Alabama, no Negro is ever embarrassed. He knows the cafes he goes to, he knows the ones that the whites go to. Uh, and that the United States government and the United States people are committed to it. Uh, it's unfortunate that these pictures go abroad. I don't think there's any question that it affects our position throughout the world. But that's only a secondary reason for doing what we have to do. The first reason is because it's the right thing to do. And as President Kennedy has said, we're going to do this because it's the right thing to do. I'm for you 100% or 1,000%. I don't have them. I have no single person yet that condemns you and everybody bragging on you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. This is Ms. Whiteman. I saw you here about two months ago, you yeah. know, and had a little chat with you. Yeah. And I just want to tell you, we just think you're wonderful and hope you're going to be successful. Thank you very much. Where are you all from? Uh, Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Blunt, good old Blunt County. Hi, partner. Glad to see you. It's an honor to meet you. Well, thank you for your kind We're proud of our dog and what you're doing. Thank you. Back. Thank you very much, dear. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, he used to try to just tell them, what do you want to do most in life? Become the governor of the state of Alabama. <laughs> 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 you think you can change things, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> No, no. I just want to become the governor. Yeah, I'm The man said the other day, said, uh, you give these niggas an empty, it'll take a mile. And I just don't know where the world's going to happen. Hell just popping all over the place. So if you give me an empty, I mean, you let me in your university, I'll become the governor. That's what they think. <laughs> sure, I love it. Sure, I love the red, white, and blue. Yes. Turn <laughs> that. Oh, Nick. Where's Nick on? Hey, Nick. Oh, uh, I talked to uh, General Abrams about uh, getting these people. I thought that we'd come up with a plan about uh, how we're going to handle the governor. I don't like the idea of picking him up. And uh, uh, perhaps you'd work that out with him as to pushing the governor aside, etc., and how many people would be. It is so fantastic in this day and time to even uh, be ha trying to handle a governor of a sovereign state just like a <coughs> uh, common lawbreaker. According to the federal court order, Governor Wallace would be breaking the law if he were to stand in the door and block the students. Robert Kennedy has been trying to work out a strategy that would avoid jailing the governor or backing down in the face of his defiance. The governor has indicated that he might back down if the federal government were to send in troops, a move the government will try to avoid unless a clear necessity is made apparent. The attorney general is about to suggest his strategy to the president. Its first step would be to prevent actual law breaking by the governor through a technicality by keeping the students in a car while Nicholas Katzenbach confronts the governor. Then if he still refuses, then Nick Katzenbach will say that we got this court order and we have to go through on legal basis. He's made the test. This matter should be determined in the courts. It shouldn't be determined out here. He's had this opportunity and should let him go through or otherwise we're going to have to take other steps because these students are going to attend the University of Alabama. Then uh, if he still doesn't move, then we'll try to get by him. Pushing? We're pushing a little bit. Just yeah, having somebody to walk stand around in front of him and try to walk through. There's three doors. We're going to try to have somebody inside who will open up the other, one of the other doors so that can, we can't cover all three doors and just have the girls and the boys just try to go through another door. Anyway, we're gonna, that's going to be up to Nick Katzenbach as to how far we can go in that. If he's able to keep the doors locked and keep, actually keep them out and, and, it, and it's going to require knocking them down or some real forceful action, then they will pull away. What we think then is that they'll go to their dormitories and say, well, we'll work out the registration sometime else. They'll go to their dormitories and... Are they going to sign? Yes. By going to dormitories, the students would remain on campus and the federal government would not have retreated. But having failed to pass a governor armed with his own state troopers and National Guard, the federal government would have to return for a second try armed with greater force. The president could take over the governor's troops by nationalizing the Alabama Guard, but that could take another day, 24 hours, that would be an embarrassing delay for the federal government. I think our being turned back by the governor 
letting that situation exist throughout the country and the world for even 24 hours. All right, well, I don't mind going. Okay, let's go with the God. Well, it's a step because we, what we try to do, of course, is to put it on his back completely. But uh, we're trying to get this worked out. Well, of course, he called up the God. Uh, it seems to me we might try to tie it back and continue to say that he's called up the God, which indicates that he thinks the situation is very critical. After all, he called up the God. It may produce a situation which is necessitated you calling up 600 gods. I'm therefore to meet my response, be prepared for any situation because of you are, we are going to call, federalize this God and so on and so forth. Now, he may announce that in that case he won't be responsible for law and order, but that's, that could come any day. So that. That's the matter. Then we would have the God ready. And then we would use well, then, Yeah, then I suppose you'd say that you would hope that none of this would be necessary, that he would stay at home, and in your judgment, that if he does stay at home, the local police department and it the would, it, the university. It, it, it might possibly avoid this problem for us. I mean, there's advantages of your calling up the guard. Right, now, so they're under the desk. I'm going to have to wait for 24 hours. Let me just call Cy Vance and see if there's anything that we could do before 24 hours. Hey, Cy, uh, assuming that the, we get turned back at 10.30 tomorrow morning, uh, their time, is there any way that you could get the guard in there, uh, the Tuscaloosa guard in there by 4 o'clock that afternoon? Is there any Unless Robert Kennedy now? can work out a faster way to nationalize the guard, the president will have only two alternatives. Send in troops at the outset before a need for them could be publicly demonstrated, or else wait until after being turned back and suffer a 24-hour delay at the hands of the governor. Could you get them there by 4 o'clock that afternoon? So I would think that uh, probably, uh, unless we change, that probably the best thing to do would be to go as scheduled. Just put up with the 24 hours, but we would be nationalizing the guard in that period. We could make a speech on television and other action which would indicate that we are not permitting him to get away with the clients. It's inevitable that we're going to be successful. So I would think that uh, that's good with that. Uh, State troopers. The schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama. Nearby, Nicholas Katzenbach is briefing federal marshals who will be guarding the students tomorrow. You're going to have uh, guns, it's going to be pretty hard not to. I, I'd rather not have them visible, I think that's the problem. Uh, and therefore, I think. Uh, I don't think we need any armbands because they. The word marshal, since Oxford, is kind of a dirty word now. Yeah, I hate to say it, but it is. And if we can be unostentatious about what we do, we're in a much better position to afford protection to these people if it's needed. And uh, not that I want any shooting or anything of that kind, but if you're in an escort of that kind, you've got to take whatever force is necessary to protect the lives of those uh, two students. Whatever happened to any marshals, whatever happened to me or anybody else, I didn't want the marshals to have any doubt at all that they could use weapons if necessary to protect the lives of those two students. 11 o'clock, the night before the confrontation, and Vivian is still concerned about what to do if the governor turns her back. But if we aren't accepted, then we'll just come on back here. Yeah. I mean, we won't have to, we won't say anything to report us. No, 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 no. You can't truly 100% protect anyone if there's a madman out there that who's ready to attack. Early morning, the day of the confrontation. General, uh, if the president signed that proclamation in another hour or so, whether you could uh, get the guard together by 10.30 your time. Uh, ready and in place and and under the proper direction uh, by uh, three hours later, which would be 10.30. Now, the problem, the biggest problem in this is General Graham. Even if you notified General Graham now and got a plane there, you couldn't get him in into uh, Tuscaloosa in five hours? Oh. Uh, just a minute, Bert. How are you doing? Yeah. 
But we're still considering what we ought to do uh, this morning and whether or not we should uh, call up the guard and just have them already there go in with you. What do you think of that? He won't step aside under it in the first place. He'll be, he'll be carried off by soldiers, and I think you ought to... Well, I have every indication he's not going to step aside up there. And I have every indication he will dramatize to that group of reporters and that crowd the fact that he has been forcibly removed. But I don't see what the third alternative is. Well, the third alternative is the one that I indicated, Burke. Uh, everybody else can see it. It's simply that we just reduce the going through that door to nothing. And they start attending classes. Now, the governor cannot block all those classes. You mean to not bring the National Guard out at all? Uh, I mean, he won't put up with it, and uh, it won't work in that sense. The only danger with that plan that I see, and it's one that ought to be weighed, is that the governor's resentment at being made a fool of will be such that he will move way over to the segregationist side and make life much more difficult and more dangerous in the future. Of course, he might do that anyhow. Robert Kennedy has managed to reduce the time That's right. of getting the guard That's to the right. campus to five hours and maybe yeah. four. Now he suggests a new plan. Allow Katzenbach to be turned back by the governor. What do you think he then nationalize the guard fast enough to return for a second try that same afternoon. Coming back, if he won't give you any satisfactory answer, coming back, nationalizing the guard, then coming back with them then. If you want to think about that for a few minutes. This is to have the confrontation with Ian Macon and Peyton Norville, the students remaining in the car. Saying, I want to know what you're going to do. Better. I would say two hours, in two hours and I stay on the campus. Why should those students leave the campus? Why don't they go to their rooms? That's a matter of, well, if they could go to their rooms, I think that would be a good, that would be a good solution. That way we haven't retreated anywhere. It'd be good, perfectly obvious to every one of those newspaper people that they're going to their rooms. Three of Robert Kennedy's children have stopped by to see their father. Just to a layman, it makes it clear that federalization is necessary. I'm going to say, I can make no other assumption under these circumstances if you fail to give me that assurance. The ball is with you. But Yes, he is. He, he, he was one second ago. He likes it. Uh, you want him back? I can put him on, Bob. No, he says he likes this. It makes clearer the basis that, uh, of calling up the guard, and he thinks it's a good scheme. He prefers it. You want to say hello to Carrie? Yeah. Hi, Hi Carrie. How you doing? How are you doing? No, I'm not out at your house. I am way down in the Southland. Way down south. And you know what the temperature is down here? The temperature down here is 98 degrees. You tell your father that. Tell him we're all going to get hardship fed. Get Carrie on here. Carrie. We're all going to get hardship today. We're going to all get what? Hardship today. Uh, okay, say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Hello? Well, listen, Nick, what, uh, why don't we plan that? And, uh, uh, and, uh, I think, uh, what do you think, Bert? I'll take the students on. I will leave them in the car, and they will go to their dormitories thereafter. And then the students will come back and register in the afternoon. Nick, uh, uh what are you going to say to him again now? 
I know, and you're going to have to play it a little bit by ear, but I wouldn't uh, take, I wouldn't take him too, I mean, almost dis dismiss him as uh, being rather a second-rate figure for you. I mean, you, you, you're, he's wasting your time, he's wasting the student's time, and he's caused a big scene up there, and, you know, I'd have that sort of tone of voice. Don't, don't you think? Yeah. All right. Good luck. You'll do well. Right? You, you know, it'll work well. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. sir. I appreciate y'all saying you're that. Hi, right, sweetie. Yes, sir. Glad to see y'all. Right. I know you do. Thank yes, you very much. Yeah, I'm glad y'all came. I went to the university. I've never been there before. Attorney John P. Cohen, Montgomery attorney, close friend of the governor, is in the advance. directly to the governor, Katzenbach. And I've come here to ask you now for an unequivocal assurance that you will permit these students who, after all, merely want an education at the great university. Well, now, you make your statement, but we don't need for you to make a speech. You make your statement. I will make my statement, Governor. I was in the process of making my statement. And I'm asking from you an unequivocal assurance that you will not bar entry to these students to Vivian Malone and to James Hood, and that you will step aside peacefully and do your constitutional duty as governor. Uh, is he getting to talk to the governor? I have a statement to read. As governor and chief magistrate of the state of Alabama, I deem it to be my solemn obligation and duty to stand before you representing the rights and sovereignty of this state and its peoples. The unwelcomed, unwanted, unwarranted, and force-induced intrusion upon the campus of the University of Alabama, today of the might of the central government, offers frightful example of the oppression of the rights, privileges, and sovereignty of this state by officers of the federal government. Do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. <clears throat> Governor Wallace, I take it from that uh, statement that uh, you are going to stand in that door and that you are not going to carry out the orders of uh, this court, and that you are going to resist us from doing so. Is that correct? I stand upon the statement. Stand upon that statement. Governor, I'm not interested in a show. I don't know what the purpose of the show is. I am interested in the orders of these courts being enforced. That is my only responsibility here. I ask you once more, the choice is yours. There is no choice that the United States government has in this but to see that the lawful orders of its court are enforced. Governor George Wallace of Alabama has stood in the schoolhouse door. He has refused to permit Nicholas Katzenbach, Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and Marshal Peyton Norville escort the two Negro students in to sign up for summer classes. Now, Nick, Nicholas Katzenbach and uh, Marshal Norville, flanking Vivian Malone, are walking down the street. Apparently, they are going to walk to another door of the schoolhouse. Where do we get by? We have now been informed that Vivian Malone is being escorted to a women's dormitory here on the campus of the University of Alabama. 
Vivian Malone is now out of our view, but the car with Jimmy Hood is leaving the area of the auditorium, presumably to go to his dormitory. Can we get hold of uh, Mr. Katzen back? Hold on. Well, they, they have to read. We can only talk to them, him, through a relay, and we can hear him talk back. Well, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, we want to go ahead and issue the proclamation, nationalize the guard, and find out what... Sir, do you want to talk to me? Yeah. Would you mind just going back so I can have some communication? No. Are you going to get back, please? How far? Okay, go ahead. They can't hear it. On the 10th floor, the message, uh, message is as follows. Uh, Washington intends to issue the executive order to federalize the troops. Also, do you expect any problems? I do not presently expect any problems, but they are probably thinking. 10th floor. He is not expecting any trouble, but the people here think he is. That's not satisfying. What is that? Well, his answer was that he was not expecting the trouble that the people here think he is. That's a awful, that's too bad. Can you get Nick on the phone? Directly. Well, why don't we just go ahead and do it? Well, because I want to find out what the governor said. It's silly to do that. Hey, guys, I'm alive. Come through. OK, OK. Just tell me. Hello? Oh, Nick? Now, uh, did the governor say anything which would lead us not to issue this proclamation? Yeah. Nicholas Katzenbach has agreed that it is time for the president to sign the proclamation nationalizing the guard. Oh, can I have the president? A call to the president. So will you issue the proclamation now and sign it? The executive order, yeah. Right now? Okay, okay. The National Guard troops arrive by mid-afternoon. General Graham, commander of the Alabama National Guard. Governor Wallace was his commander. Now, the general confronts the governor as a representative of the federal government. He is in command of 17,000 troops, 100 of which are on the campus. And, 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 and the, the South this year, next year, 
will decide who the next president is. Whoever the South votes for will be the president, because you can't win without the South. And you're going to see that the South is going to be against some folks. So you've been used, getting used to these things. But I think if, uh, as soon as we could, to have that draft, because we might have some ideas and stand for the speech. And Louis Martin, I think. Okay. Okay. He's going to make that speech. He's going to make the speech. The yeah. president has decided to make a major commitment tonight in an address to the nation. I hope that every American will stop and examine his conscience about this and other related incidents. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay. 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It is a time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. This is what we're talking about, and this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. And in meeting it, I ask the support of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. It was at that time by far the strongest speech that had ever been made in support of civil rights by any president. The kind of people we got, they just, we just had peace, but we got, we had peace, but we got troops. No telling what we'd get if we had a little disorder. <laughs> Might get the United Nations down on top of us. I was glad it was over. I mean, this is, I mean, there was not a letdown. It was, there was a sense of accomplishment. We had done what I know I had set out to do at least, you know, two and a half, three years earlier. So it was like, it's, you know, finally over. We've made one hurdle. But it wasn't the easiest environment to survive in. We were ostracized. Um, I was befriended by some uh, students there, but out of the four or 5,000 students there that summer, you know, we were talking about maybe five or six. Two days later, Negro Dave McLathery enrolled at the University of Alabama campus in Huntsville without escort or incident of any kind. It went without a hitch. Uh, he went completely unaccompanied all the way from here to the, the... They don't see how they could have missed it, Bob. He parked in the parking lot like other students. Other students registered before him and after him. And uh, he walked in the same way that they did. But that was the start. Uh, and it committed the Kennedy administration and Lyndon Johnson's administration uh, to that road. And uh, I think it's a very proud moment in our history. A final call to the president. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, it was really good. I think it's really good. And I think it's well to have it behind us. <laughs>